I'd like to do tonight uh, is I'm going to have some prepared remarks just to kind of orient ourselves to to the, the, what we're what we're studying tonight, what we're looking at, which is the U.S. Constitution. We'll look at kind of the the antecedent to the U.S. Constitution, the Articles of Confederation. Um, we'll look at some of the compromises related to the Constitution itself. Uh, some of those compromises will will of course be important for our understanding of our discussion of slavery, um, but not not only uh, slavery. And then we're going to be looking at the, the four constitutional controversies that, um, that really kind of wrapped, uh, wrapped the attention of uh, American people, especially the elite, the American elite, for about the first decade that the Constitution was in force. So the period of time that we're looking at tonight with these four controversies is a rather short period of time. It's, it's from 1790 to about 1800. Um, but we're talking about the first government, the first Congress. We're talking about people like Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, um, John Adams. So, you know, we're, we're talking about some, some great minds who were, who were there at the beginning in, in constructing the Constitution. Uh, but even they found themselves debating on, on kind of issues that, that emanated from the Constitution. So um, this is go I'm going to teach this kind of like a, a con law, constitutional law class, okay? An introduction to constitutional law. It's what I'm most comfortable with. I, I do know history, but I'm more comfortable with, with teaching in a constitutional law format. And so when, when studying uh, the Constitution, uh, the legal parameters of the Constitution. There are two basic ways of doing it. One is to look at the, the structure and processes of set out by the Constitution. The other is to focus on the issue of rights as expounded through the Constitution. Okay, but I think tonight uh, we'll be looking at the U.S. Constitution primarily through the lens of its structure and process. So um, it's important to know that that you know, the Constitution is, is divided into a number of different articles. Uh, article 1, does anybody know what Article 1 deals with, with the Constitution? What, what, what part of the U.S. government does Article 1 deal with? The Congress, that's right. So Article 1 lays out the responsibilities and powers of Congress. So, so we'll be looking at Article 1 uh, powers and responsibilities uh, tonight. Article 2 of the Constitution, the executive. And Article 3 would be the, the federal judiciary, okay? uh, the shortest <laughs> of the articles. Uh, the, the judiciary was, was something that, uh, that perhaps was left uh, unattended uh, by, the, by the close of the Constitutional Convention of 87. So Article 2, the powers and rules that govern the executive branch. Article 3, the powers and rules that govern the federal judiciary. Article 4 of the Constitution deals with the relationship between the federal and state governments. What system do we call that? The system of federalism. That's right, federalism. So Article 4 deals with federalism. Okay. And there are other articles as well. We'll be looking at Article uh, 5 and 6. All right. Doesn't mean that we're not going to be looking at the issue of rights tonight. We will be looking at the issue of rights, but we'll be doing it through our understanding of the structure and process of the government. And I think it's important to start with the structure and process uh, before we can really have have a discussion about rights as they might appear either in the document itself or in the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, which are called the Bill of Rights. That's right. So because we're looking at the structure and process of the Constitution, we, we need to start with the Articles of Confederation, okay, which was really the, the first Constitution of the United States of America. The war ended, the, the Revolutionary War, of course, began in 1777, not 1776, um, but it ended in about 1782. Federal, uh, British troops, there was a, a slow drawdown of British troops that finally ended the last British troops, kind of like what we saw in the drawdown from Afghanistan, though a little bit more orderly than that drawdown. The last of the British troops exited the, the colonies, soon become imme immediate states uh, in about 1783. 
agree. So a lot of people ask, well, then what government existed or what document, right, codified what kind of government between 1783 and 1787 when the Constitutional Convention was called? And that was the, the Articles of Confederation. All right. You'll note that the, if, you, if you do read the articles, the Articles of Confederation begins with a talk of state. Whereas the Constitution famously begins with what three words? We the people, right? So there's something already very different going on in the U.S. Constitution versus the Articles of Confederation. In fact, the driving force behind the Constitutional Convention of 1787 in Philadelphia was a belief among many that the principal weakness of the Articles was that it made the national government a handmaiden of the states. What that means is is, is that the states retained all of the power under the Articles of Confederation. The national government was more or less uh, without sovereignty. And so the national government was not only, a, it was a single assembly under the Articles of Confederation. There was no bicameral legislature. Each state got one vote. Representation might have been different based on the state. It could be anywhere from two representatives to, I believe, seven. But each state got only one vote vote in the single assembly. There was no separate executive branch and there was no separate judiciary. There was no bicameral legislature, no separate executive, no separate judiciary. So the national government codified through the articles did not possess power independent of the states. All representatives were chosen by state legislatures. Okay, there was no direct election of representatives, whether it be in the House or the Senate, although if you do know anything about the U.S. Constitution, you'll know that for about the first hundred years or so, <clears throat> senators were not directly elected by the people either. They were chosen by the legislature. But this was, in fact, the case for all representatives in, in, <clears throat> under the Articles, under the provisions of the Articles of Confederation. The militia remained in the control of the states. There's famous letters of George Washington writing the Continental Congress, the Congress that preceded the Confederate Congress, basically complaining, openly complaining, something that was not his style, but nonetheless openly complaining that he could not draw up enough troops uh, to, to fight the battles against the British because of state interference. The states uh, would not give him the, the requisite troops. There was no common currency under the Articles of Confederation. And even if laws were passed, and they certainly were, by the Confederate Congress, there was no ma means of enforcing those laws. Okay, so if you think of a government as having three principal roles, a law-making power, a law-enforcing power, and a law, let's say, uh, adjudicating or deciding power, you'll see that the Confederate Congress looked powerful. It was a fusion of powers, right? All those powers were within the Confederate Congress, but it had no means of separately enforcing its laws separate of the states, and so it was a very weak national government. We see that with the American Constitution, those three basic powers of government are separate. So the law-making power is found in the legislature, the law-enforcing power is found in the executive branch, and I guess you would call it the law adjudicating or law deciding power. What happens when there is a discrepancy in, t in interpretation of the law? Well, that is handled by the, the courts. So while it was controversial, calling a convention in 1787 to discuss ways of reforming the Articles was thought absolutely necessary. Yet when Madison proposed throwing out the Articles entirely and adopting a totally new constitutional arrangement, many state delegates were caught unawares and rushed to Philadelphia. So it, it's actually, it was common knowledge of the time that there were going to be some reforms <laughs> made to the Articles of Confederation, but most of the delegates thought that that's where it was going to end. Madison actually comes to Philadelphia early and on the very first day of the convention proposes what is called the Virginia Plan, a brand new form of government and it really, really shocked those in attendance. And so Madison was, was able to brilliantly uh, set the stage for, for what followed. Everybody had to pivot from what Madison had proposed with the Virginia. You may know that uh, 
<clears throat> the Virginia plan proposed uh, separation uh, of powers, but that in the legislature it proposed that representation would be uh, based on population size. Any reason why you, you might think that a state like Virginia would be interested in having representation based on population? There's a lot of people and a lot of what, particularly what kind of people in Virginia? Slaves. So there was already an interest in counting slave uh, people for the purpose purposes of apportionment. Uh, New Jersey came up with a counterproposal. New Jersey, believe it or not, <laughs> was a less populous state at that time. Uh, you know, history has a funny way of, of, uh, of, of showing us ironies. New Jersey was a less populous state, and New Jersey proposed instead that representatives would be, would have, would be fixed, that there would be fixed representation, a fixed number of representatives, very much like what you saw with the Articles of Confederation. Fixed number of representatives for each state. The Great Compromise, also known as the Connecticut Compromise. That's right, it was the delegates of Connecticut who said, well, let's find some way of cutting the Gordian knot, so to speak. We have a, a bit of a, of a deadlock here. How can, we, how can we find a compromise? And so the compromise, of course, was apportion a fixed number of delegates or representatives to the Senate and to make the House of Representatives apportioned by uh, the proportional number of people within each state. State. Not each representative would represent a number not to exceed 30,000, and that is still the case to this day. 30,000. Um, this great compromise, of course, dealt with the apportionment of representation among the states. The legislature was divided into a House and Senate. The lower House of Representatives would be apportioned proportional to population. The Senate's representatives would be fixed at two. The great compromise led immediately to the three fifths. Compromise. As a means of striking agreement between the slave faction, the South, who wanted chattel slaves to be counted as people for the purposes of representation, but who did not want to give them political rights, much less the freedom to enjoy those rights. The Northern states, through a mix of calculation and condemnation, proposed counting a slave as three-fifths of a human being in order to stem the electoral power they foresaw the South accruing without such. In fact, Thomas Jefferson lost to uh, John Adams in the 17, I believe it's the 1796 election. In the election of 1800, Thomas Jefferson did beat John Adams, but historians note that he would not have beat John Adams if not for the three-fifths uh, compromise. The three-fifths compromise gave a lot of electoral clout to the South. It's one it's reason one why so many presidents uh, in the early years of the American Republic hailed from Southern states because of the, um, the three-fifths compromise. And it's, if we know anything about the Electoral College, the Electoral College is also based on the proportional number of people within each state. It's not a fixed number. And so, so Southern candidates for president often had an electoral advantage over Northern candidates. So as I say here, slavery gave Southern states a divide, decided advantage choosing presidents sympathetic to the Southern slave interests and presidents appoint uh, judges. And oh. so uh, the, the early years of the American judiciary was heavily, heavily, heavily in favor of the Southern interest as well. Uh, there was an, also an inclusion of the Fugitive Slave Clause and a 20-year moratorium on debating the legality of the importation of slaves. So when you're looking at the, the issue of slavery, okay, when we're looking at the issue of slavery, we see three major, major compromises made at the time that the Constitution Constitution was created. The first being the three-fifths compromise, the second being this fugitive slave clause compromise, and the third being a 20-year moratorium on, on debating the legality of the importation of slaves. Not a lot of people realize how much of the slave interest is represented in the U.S. Constitution. It's right there in black and white. In fact, I think we should actually look at it momentarily. The, the issue of the moratorium had to do with whether or not the slave trade 
should continue or not, or whether or not the United States should, should end the slave trade. And the southern states, of course, they wanted the slave trade to continue. The northern states were opposed, and so there was a compromise that uh, the issue would not be broached again until 1808. To Thomas Jefferson's credit, he was president. He did sign into law the end of the North American slave trade. That didn't end slavery by any means, but it ended the importation of slaves, but that wasn't until 1808, 20 years after the Constitution was finally ratified in 1788. And so I thought maybe it'd be interesting. I, I don't have a lot of copies copies of it, I'm sorry to say, but doing a little bit of a dive into the Constitution uh, just to, to see the parts uh, dealing with slavery and to see in the ways in which um, the Constitution dealt with the issue of slavery. The, the word slavery never appears in the Constitution, okay? The, the, the framers of the Constitution were very careful to avoid the term slave, so it, it's very hard sometimes to find in the document itself where these particular clauses arise. But in Article 1, again, dealing with the powers and uh, responsibilities of Congress, Article 1 does raise this issue. It says, representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this unit according to the respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years. A person's bound to service. This is the, the expression that was used for chattel slavery. And excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. Okay, so people bound to service would be included as three-fifths of a person for the purposes of apportionment. The fugitive slave clause, again, if you have the, the document in front of you, unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of them at my disposal. Uh, I wish I had been able to bring more for everybody. Oh. Article 4, Section 2 of the, uh, Article 4, if, if you recall, Article 4 deals with um, the issue of federalism, so the relationship between the federal and state governments. And so what happens when a there is a fugitive slave? We There's a recent uh, movie about Harriet Tubman, I think, on Netflix, and we know about the Underground Railroad. What happens when a slave finds freedom in the North? Are there troubles over? Over. Well, no. According to the Constitution, no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall, in consequence of any law or regulation there, therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. So, slaveholders, um, this, this is really what gave rise to, to the, the whole notion of bounty hunting in the United States, slaveholders uh, slave would either on their own or they would hire people to, to bring back their slaves, even if they had escaped to the North. This is in real, this, this particular provision of Article 4 is in real tension with Section 2 of the same article, and I want you to listen to this section here. So this is really what amount, this is really what gave gave uh, a voice to the controversy over the fugitive slave clause, and it was a very serious controversy that embroiled the nation right up, especially through the 1850s. Um, until the Dred Scott decision. Section 2 says the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. So in this very same article and the very same section of the same article, Section 2, you have one paragraph that essentially says citizens are able to, as Hamilton said, engage in egress and regress. They can enter a state and they can leave a state. They can bring their property property into a state. They are free. They have all of the due process rights afforded them under the Constitution of life, liberty, and property. So there were no barrier entry or to leaving one state or another. And yet in this very same article, we have the Fugitive Slave Clause. But notice the difference in language. Section 2, dealing with privileges and immunities, speaks of citizens. 
of each state. Whereas the section that follows dealing with the Fugitive Slave Clause deals uses the term person. Okay, so, so there was a real um, effort made in the South, and the Taney Court really affirms this in the infamous Dred Scott decision um, in that the, ten, the Taney Court forever declaring until the outbreak of the Civil War, of course, which didn't, didn't follow long after, but forever declaring that African Americans anywhere and everywhere were forever uh, not granted citizenship rights. So there was a real effort among the, the, the delegates of the South, the, the interests of the South, to disenfranchise African Americans of their citizenship rights. And of course, a lot of court cases, court cases did ensue dealing with this issue. There, there's a famous case of the, uh, we see then that, you know, particularly with that issue, there's a real tension within the Constitution, exactly what we're supposed to be looking at tonight, the way in which the Constitution establishes uh, rules, but by doing so also creates controversy. Okay. And so that would really be a major controversy dealing with slavery, the, the notion of the difference between, on the one hand, citizenship rights, privileges, and immunities, and on the other hand, uh, the way in which uh, this fugitive slave clause denied those very same, those very same privileges and immunities immunities rights to African Americans. And of course, after the Civil War, you had the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. And then perhaps, I won't say more importantly, but certainly having a much longer impact for all of us, but particularly for African Americans, the 14th Amendment, which really sets out in black and white those people who are in the United States, who are born in the United States, are citizens of the United States, that there is no more question on this citizenship issue as provided by the 14th Amendment. That deals with the first of our controversies, uh, slavery. What about the National Bank? As it turns out, the National Bank controversy was an even bigger controversy to the American people than was slavery. The National Bank controversy was really a very contentious controversy that went well beyond the period of time that we're looking at here, all the way to the point where Andrew Jackson ended up abolishing the National Bank during his presidency. But the the Constitution was very controversial, not only with respect to slavery, right? There were some like Alexander Hamilton. Has anybody seen the musical Hamilton? I have not. Is it good? <laughs> I still haven't seen it. But Alexander Hamilton wanted to create a national bank to encourage industry and foster foreign investment. So Hamilton was from New York. He wanted the, uh, the American capital to be in New York City. The American capital was in New York City. The very first Congress of the United States met in New York City. George Washington, instead of the White House, he lived in a uh, residence in New York City. Uh, then, of course, uh, through a compromise uh, dealing with the assumption of debt, there was the compromise of, you know, oh. Hamilton would get his debt assumption, assuming all the debt of the state. And in return for that, uh, Hamilton would not cause too many, too much trouble in allowing capital to be moved to this 10 mile, 10 square mile region off the Potomac. It was just pure swampland, <laughs> you know. That's Washington, D.C. today. It was just nothing but uh, that yeah. was the proposed place of the new cap. But the National Bank was an extremely, extremely um, controversial idea because uh, whereas as the northern commercial interest really wanted to kind of model the economy after Great Britain, the southern plantation uh, slave interest was much more agrarian and did not, felt extremely threatened by, by northern industry, uh, and northern uh, investment, especially for, foreign investment. So most uh, were opposed to this to the creation of a nat national bank. And there was no power of incorporation in the U.S. Constitution. So the U.S. Constitution does not have a power of incorporation to incorporate um, such things as the national bank. It's completely, the Constitution is completely silent on this. Um, can you think of another corporation, something that the U.S. Uh, has incorporated as part of I'll, its? I'll tell you. Amtrak is part of the, the incorporated uh, legacy. Um, the Postal Service 
as well. All of these features were not given um, any kind of, uh, there was no codified, specific, enumerated power in Congress to create any of these corporate entities, particularly the National Bank. And this was exactly the, ar ar the argument made by Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson said, show me in the Constitution where the words national bank and you get a national bank. All right. And there were no words in the Constitution outlining a national bank. And so Jefferson thought using you know, a, a kind of a strict interpretation of the Constitution, which was very much his his you know, style. He thought, well, then we can't have a national bank. There's no power of incorporation included in the Constitution. Ironically, there was a power of incorporation in the Articles of Confederation, but not in the U.S. Constitution. But this didn't stop Hamilton. Hamilton looked to a particular clause in the Constitution. It's called the Necessary and Proper Clause. It's also called, I'm not sure if people know, what, what's the other name? A bit more of a dubious name given to this clause. It's called the Elastic Clause. Why do you think it's called the Elastic Clause? It's a clause that can be used for anything and everything. And right. so Hamilton looked to a particular clause in the Constitution and uh, uh, brilliantly argued that this clause, right, this clause could provide for a, a power of incorporation for a national bank. It's the necessary and proper clause to the Constitution. Again, I'm sorry that not everybody has it, but it's in Article 1, Section 8. So Article 1 deals with all the enumerated powers. Section 8 deals with all the enumerated powers of Congress, something I should have mentioned. You know, one thing that the, the framers were very very, very keen on was enumerating the powers of Congress, spelling them out in black and white. States would know where the limits of the national government's power was. The framers to the Constitution made great efforts to spell out the powers of the Congress so Congress would have the specific unshared and enumerated power, right, to provide and maintain a navy, for instance. The states could not share in this power or to provide for calling forth the militia. This was a power organizing and arming and disciplining the militia. This was uh, to borrow money, particularly on the credit of the United States. So these were the enumerated powers of Congress. But there's one provision in Article 1, Section 8, is this necessary and proper clause. I want to read it to you, and you'll see the elasticity of it. To make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing power and all other powers vested by this constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. So the translation of this clause is essentially if the government says it needs something, it gets it. <laughs> okay. This is the translation of this clause. Hamilton argued, and I think he argued successfully that of course it was a Federalist Pact Congress that he was arguing to, or, so they were they were a lot more amenable to this argument than was the Southern interest. But this was one of the big issues, created tremendous factionalism between the North and the South, and really and emanating ultimately uh, in, in the two-party uh, system that we now have. There were no parties during this period of time. There were the Federalists. There were also a faction called the Anti-Federalists, but there were no actual organized parties in government. In fact, parties were thought anathema to Republican government because they would factionalize the whole. But nonetheless, even though parties were thought anathema to Republican government, this kind of government that was called forth through the Constitution really allowed for factionalism. Famously, Madison said you can either extinguish factionalism by coming down hard and eliminating it, eliminating the causes of it, or controlling the effects of faction. So you can either eliminate faction by outlawing it, outlawing parties, outlawing disagreement, outlawing difference, or you can control the effects of faction. And you do that, right, Madison said famously, by increasing the number of factions. <laughs> Not decreasing the number, but actually increasing the number of factions. Make so many factions that no one fact can ever really become uh, tyrannical over the rest. And so the legacy of, of the U.S. Constitution was one in which factionalism would um, carry 
the day. And how this relates, of course, is that something so like the National uh, Bank really, really brought out a factional uh, disagreement, particularly northern merchant interests and southern the Southern slave. So, Hamilton argues that the necessary and proper cause gives the power of the National Bank. The problem, of course, is that the power that Congress has take money, it says no money shall, this is in the very same, uh, it's, in, it's in the next section in Article 1. No money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law and a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all public money should be published time. from time to time. And so one of the reasons Ma Hamilton wanted a national bank is he thought it would be a great end run around congressional oversight. Right. Today, the national bank is called what? The Federal Reserve. Yeah. Of course, the, the Re Federal Reserve is a very transparent institution. Everybody knows what's going on in the Federal Reserve, right? The Congress knows exactly what, what's happening in the Federal Reserve. Okay. No, this was the fear of a national bank is that you were going to create an institution that was going to, to circulate money, that was going to take on a lot of debt, and it was going to do it outside of the treasury, outside of congressional oversight. And of course, this, this, this is only a bigger problem today than it was in, in Hamilton's time with the Great Recession, the TARP funds that were released through the Federal Reserve. There are stories of U.S. senators uh, trying to call up the Federal Reserve, trying to figure out where the money is going. going, and they're given, they're given Muzak, you know, <laughs> U.S. senators. This might be an apocryphal story, but, you know, it's yeah. still it's a nice one. The idea that a U.S. senator can, can't, can't even find out what's happening in the Federal Reserve. And so it's, it's, it's a rather opaque institution. Hamilton wanted it this way, you know, and it was precisely because of that opacity that Jefferson was opposed. You have to, we, we have to remember one of the great ironies of the U.S. Constitution. It was really the slave interest, not the northern interest, that were much more interested in individual right. And so the Bill of Rights, rights, right, that came as the, the rights against federal encroachment. The Bill of Rights were, were crafted by, by the Anti-Federalists. They were really the, the genius of the, the Anti-Federalists, the non-Federalist faction, the, the, the faction that was not interested in things like the National Bank, imperious Exact. Curious, exact. All right. So we see then that, you know, with the national bank controversy, there's a real, real conflict in the Constitution itself. On the one hand, you have this elastic clause, the necessary and proper clause. But then on the other hand, you do have ways in which Congress can, can borrow money absent a national bank through the Treasury, but it would have to be all stipulated by Congress. And so it would have to go through Congress. And so in the end, the national bank controversy did carry the day for Hamilton. Hamilton got his national bank, but it was it was an it was an uneasy road. Madison, so the national bank was was created with a 20-year lease. Madison allowed the lease to expire in 1811, I believe. Uh, 1812, you had this naval war. We didn't have a national bank in times of emergency to borrow a lot of money. <laughs> Right, which is what a national bank can be very useful for, uh, borrowing money quickly. Uh, Madison, after the War of 1812, uh, helped to reestablish the Second National Bank. Second National Bank was extremely uh, corrupt. Andrew Jackson, uh, he made it one of his one uh, of his electoral promises that he would abolish the National Bank if elected. And when he was elected, he did exactly that. He abolished it. And it wasn't until um, I think 1913, the Federal Reserve Act of 19. 13 that we had a, a national bank again and so and, and of course we haven't looked back right we haven't looked back since then though hamilton got his way initially the national bank did have a very tortuous road to its current um, form right. and so the next controversy i like to look at is uh the controversy of, of dealing with neutrality okay the neutrality controversy and so the neutrality proclamation so, let's set the the historical stage for 
for neutrality. We have a long-standing treaty with France. France was this kind of secret partner of ours during the revolution. They came, they, they helped us in a tremendous time of need by financing the war, uh, the war of independence against Great Britain. And so we had a very strong treaty obligation with France. But after the French Revolution, things began, began to become very radicalized in France. And eventually the King Louis XVI had his head cut off uh, during Robespierre's uh, reign of terror. There's, there's a famous saying that the, the revolution eats its children. children. And this, this was particularly the case in France. And so this, this kind of sent off alarm bells across the Atlantic. Uh, the U.S. government, at the same time that this is happening, France is expanding. It's invading other countries, Austria, Prussia. Uh, France is on this kind of war of expansion, which often happens with newly democratizing countries. And so not only is, is the government of France rather unstable, becoming very radical, the, the country itself is on a real war footing and uh, declares war against Great Britain. France wants the United States to, to, to join in the fight. This presents a real problem for the Washington administration, right? They don't want to uh, go to war uh, with Great Britain at the behest of the French, but at the same time, we don't want to break this treaty alliance that we have with the French. And so it was thought that the compromise would be that we would just declare our neutrality. Right. We would declare our neutrality. This, of course, didn't go over very well <laughs> with the French. Uh, the French were not particularly uh, happy about. The immediate legal question in 1793 was whether the U.S. was bound by its treaty of alliance with France from the Revolutionary War to come to France's aid in its war with Britain. So were we bound by this previous treaty alliance made during the Continental Congress, continuing in effect during the Confederate Congress, or were we not? The issue was in doubt because the nature of the French regime had changed radically, right, and the circumstances were totally different from those that existed when the treaty was made. Washington issued his neutrality proclamation as an interpretation of the U.S. Treaty of Alliance with France. He declared the U.S. would stay neutral and he ordered federal prosecutors to prosecute any American citizen who violated the law of nations by failing to observe America's neutrality. There's a, there's a, in fact, a law kind of came up during the Trump impeachment. The, the, the Logan Act was a law that was passed during this time precisely because there was a uh, particular individual who who was giving aid to the French, and this was in violation of the neutrality proclamation. He was not prosecuted, though, or he was he, he was not successfully prosecuted because the jury determined that the neutrality proclamation was not, in fact, a law. It was only a proclamation made by... So the question here, then, the question here, then, is what uh, part of government has the power to make treaties? Which part of government has the power, if at all, to unmake Hamilton's argument, and he wrote as pacificist. So during this time, there was this tremendous op-ed kind of war between Hamilton and Madison. Hamilton writing with the pseudonym pacificist, Madison writing with the pseudonym Helvidius. And there was this tremendous op-ed war that went on between these two. Uh, in, in newspapers, particularly throughout the northern states. Right. And so Hamilton's argument was, was an argument for, for really what you might call a, a, a unified executive. The president right. had all foreign affairs powers, except for those expressly given to the Senate or Congress as a whole. Hamilton argues that the president's executive power included all foreign affairs powers that had belonged to King George III under the English Constitution. So if you look at Article 2, Sections 2 and 3, right, you can you can ask yourself if this uh, interpretation makes sense. So in Article 2 of the Constitution, again, remember Article 2 deals with the powers of executive branch. Article 2, Section 3, the president shall be commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy. Okay, He shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the senators present 
concur. And he shall nominate and by with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls. What's the problem with Hamilton's argument? He's saying that basically, just like King George III, the president has exclusive power to make treaties and by virtue of making treaties, unmake treaties that are made because really the issue is not making a treaty. In this case, it's it's ending a treaty. But what's the problem that we see here from the language given? He shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties. Does, Does the president have exclusive power to make and unmake treaties? No, the Constitution does not say so. And this, of course, was the argument of Madison. But as it turns out, Hamilton's argument carried the day. I, I think it, a lot of it had to do with the fact that George Washington was president, president that he had issued a new neutrality proclamation. We have to remember Washington was uh, elected unanimously, not just once, but twice. Okay. And it was only because Washington said, I'm tired of this. <laughs> I don't want to be president any long, longer. I want to retire back to my plantation that Washington did not, did not uh, stay in office longer than eight years. He was extremely popular with all factions. And so Hamilton's argument really probably doesn't make sense as the Constitution provides. However, Hamilton's argument was, in fact, that, you know, when it comes to unmaking a treaty, the Constitution is completely silent on that issue. It's not silent on the issue of making treaties, ending treaties, right? The Constitution says nothing about whether ending treaties has to be uh, something that advice and consent of the Senate. And so for that reason, Hamilton's argument won the day over Madison. But we see a real tension there, the idea of, of making treaties and unmaking treaties and what the Constitution actually tells us about this. And it's a bit vague, but a fair reason reading of the Constitution is that it might be either, it might be either interpretation. And that's precisely the issue. Uh, that, that's precisely the issue we're looking at here tonight. The Constitution can be read in so many different ways and all it takes is a brilliant mind to read it in a manner that is uh, conducive to one's interest to, to get an argument that can um, inspire and... Uh, the final um, controversy that we're going to look at is alien and sedition. And so with this particular controversy, the historical, excuse me, um, the historical context to this controversy. We just we just talked about the neutrality proclamation, the fact that you know the United States wanted to remain neutral in its relations with France. Shortly after the neutrality proclamation, only a couple years later, the United States makes a treaty with Great Britain called the Dr Jays Treaty, which reestablishes commercial activity with so Great. Imagine about 20 minutes, 20 years after the Revolutionary War. War is fought, you have you have a reestablishment of commercial relations with Great Britain. About 20 years after the Revolutionary War, uh, you have a reestablishment of commercial relations with Great Britain. You can imagine a lot of people are asking, what on earth are we doing? We're turning our backs on our French ally and we're reestablishing relations with the very country just gained independence from 20 years uh, previous. Well, well, that's the fickle nature of uh, foreign affairs, isn't it? <laughs> Alliances uh, don't always last for very long. So with the Alien Sedition Act, the, the French government was very incensed by our not only turning our back on France, previous treaties, but then by reestablishing a new treaty of alliance with Great Britain. And so the French begin to seize American merchant ships in the Atlantic, hold them for ransom. There is a... Uh, a diplomatic faction that is uh, sent to France to negotiate the release of these ships. This diplomatic fashion is that faction is then then asked for bribes. <laughs> To, to be given in exchange. And so the whole the whole affair, dubbed the XYZ affair, the, the whole affair was rather unseemly to the Adams administration. If you know anything about John, John Adams, he was a bit uptight, <laughs> right? So there's a funny story about Adams and Franklin going to France during the Revolutionary War. War. 
to gain to gain um, funding from the French. Franklin fit right in. Right? He fit he, right into France. He he loved every bit of it. He he loved the courtesans. He loved the the the, the wine. Uh, Adams was aghast. He was completely aghast at what he saw in France. It was it was just his his old New England sentiment. Right, just couldn't wrap his mind around what he was seeing. So as it turns out, Adams wasn't a very good envoy, but Franklin was a great envoy. <laughs> Franklin was the one who was able to really secure funding. So we have to kind of put our minds now in the, the shoe. We got to put ourselves in the shoes of, of Adams. He's president. There's this very unseemly occurrence happening. Not only are our merchant ships being seized in the Atlantic, but now our government is being asked for bribes in return for basically an extortion racket is underway. There are, there are calls to, to declare war against France. Hamilton wants to declare war against France. Adams, to his credit, he says the one thing he did of, of any note during his presidency was keeping us out of war. And so, to his credit, he resisted the calls to war. But there were these alien sedition acts that were created uh, during this time in Congress. They were passed in Congress. There were actually four of them, a residency act, just increasing the age for legal residents in the United States. That one was a bit uncontroversial. There was what's called an alien friends act, dealing with the way in which foreign nationals who not were not uh, who, who, who were not deemed threats to the United States the way they would be treated. Then there was an Alien Enemies Act, which really called for, for the immediate removal. So there were a lot of French who saw themselves removed from the United States during this period of time. And then most controversially, there was the Sedition Act which suggested that any attempts to lampoon the United States government would be deemed illegal. So if you engaged in what was considered a reasoned and rational discourse criticizing the U.S. government, that was fine. But if you lampoon the U.S. government, particularly the Adams administration, imagine in today's world a president having the power to arrest you for making fun of him or her. Well, this is exactly what happened with the Sedition Act. And there were people who were put on trial for lampooning the president. You know, this is the same person, Adams, who I said was not a big, big hit in France. He wanted to be called His Excellency when president. President, okay, so, so. you know this guy had had a bit of a of an ego. You know, considering he was the the son of a of a shoemaker, uh, he had he had quite an ego. Wanted and had arrested, particularly journalists, right? Journalists who who lampooned in their writing. I, I was just made aware of the fact that there was a, a publication called Is it the Philadelphia Aurora? Philadelphia Aurora, which was kind of a a, a newspaper that probably a Jeffersonian newspaper. Paper, right at this time, the papers were really it's not too much different as it is today. The newspapers were really the, the organs of, of the factions, okay. And so, so this must have been a Jeffersonian paper, a paper that was sympathetic to the Jeffersonian cause. And uh, many of those journalists, I'm sure, were either arrested or harassed for lampooning and making fun of the president. What's the, what's the controversy here? Well, I mean, obviously, you have the First Amendment, right? right. The First Amendment to the Constitution, which says that, which which provides for freedom of speech and freedom of press. And on top of that, you you don't have the word sedition appearing anywhere in the Constitution. There is a provision in Article Three, Section Three, dealing with treason, right? But sedition is not treason. S sedition is basically just rally rousing, just kind of causing either causing one to uh, rebel or inciting rebellion in some way. And so the Constitution doesn't really give an enumerated power to Congress, right? And so I think the, the only argument that could be made to justify the Sedition Act would be exactly the same argument that was used to justify the National Bank, which is the Necessary and Proper Clause, right? That whatever Congress wants, Congress gets. In contradistinction to the, the Necessary and Proper Clause as a, a 
as a legitimate basis for the Sedition Act, you have the very clear language of the First Amendment to the Constitution, right? right? And this was the arguments made by Jefferson in what were called the Virginia Resolutions, where Virginia, first time this ever happened, not the last time, the first time that Virginia and Kentucky, the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions, both of these states declared this particular law unconstitutional. Absent having a Supreme Court that had the power of judicial review that came a little later, Marbury versus Madison. Prior to that, it was really up to entities like the state to declare laws unconstitutional. So the Sedition Act failed. It, it, it was not, uh, it was an act that was immediately uh, abolished on, on with uh, uh, Jefferson's presidency. It was never put under a constitutional test by the by Supreme Court because, because the Supreme Court didn't hear any case related to it. You do have an example of the state States, right? You, the, in this case, Virginia and, and Kentucky, right. right? Declaring this, this act, act unconstitutional uh, on, on the basis of both the First Amendment and to the Constitution. The Tenth Amendment, of course, right? Reserving all rights, not completely, not totally spelled out in the Constitution to the state. All right. Well, hopefully that kind of gave you a little information about some of these controversies. And uh, thank you.